for joining us online today. At Convergence SD, we envision a place where the people of God converge with the purpose of God in establishing the kingdom of God. We'd love to hear how he's doing that in your life. So take a second and shoot us an email at info at convergencesd.com. Let us know how this ministry is impacting your life. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online at convergencesd.com or simply text your gift to 619-344-8454. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for family. Thank you for this family that you're establishing here. We pray in Jesus' name. Um, Lord, as you, you're already here with us. We've already sensed your presence. We've already got to experience you in a powerful way through music and, and uh, just through the hugs and the handshakes and the high fives. And we pray you'd continue to shower down uh, your blessing and your presence in this place and uh, open our hearts to what you want to say uh, through your word and uh, let the words that come from my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, to get us started, as is um, to, to, to be consistent, we're in a series called Christ Moss, and we talked about what that meant a couple weeks ago, um, but as I've, as I've done every Sunday as we've been in this series, I'm going to start off with 10 really bad Christmas jokes. Do it. 10 really bad jokes. Really bad. And I want to preface this by saying they are not just bad, they are really bad. And remember, there's actually 40 of them, so I, I broke them up over the four weeks. So we just do 10. Of, okay, well, what is Santa's dog's name? Santa Paws. What falls at the North Pole but never gets hurt? Snow, yeah, you got it. What never eats at Christmas dinner? The turkey, it's stuffed already. <laughs> Thanks for the courtesy laugh. Where does Santa stay when he's on holiday? No, at a ho ho hotel. What do you call Frosty the Snowman in May? A puddle, yeah. You got that one, that was easy. Did you know that Rudolph the reindeer never went to school? He was self taught was self, self-taught. Self he was... Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What did Adam say the day before Christmas? It's Christmas Eve. <laughs> what do snowmen usually wear on their heads? What do snowmen wear on their heads? Ice caps. Mm. Where do you find chili beans? At the North Pole? Chili beans. What is a librarian's favorite Christmas song? Silent, Silent Night. Yeah. Of course, she's in the library. You know? Oh, we lost that breaker. All right, well, I'm, I'm, uh, it's Christmas season. It's a Christmas holiday. We're in a Christmas series. So we're going to talk about Christmas. We're actually going to be in Luke chapter 1 again. Luke chapter 1, we, we did that a couple weeks ago, and we're, we're doing it again. Um, I want to kind of recap and, and look at, you know, you can preach the same passage of Scripture and get a different meaning. You can read the same passage of Scripture and get a different meaning every time, right? You can do that. And so we're, I did this for our first, uh, the first Sunday of the series. I'm going to do it right now. Luke chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, we're going to be there in a minute. I thought about preaching a sermon that I preached in 2014. Um, many may, maybe heard it uh, when I was uh, preaching at Foothills High School's chapel, uh, and God just revealed something really amazing to me um, from Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, if you know, is the genealogy, and most of the time when you like read the genealogy in, in Scripture, which is just a list of names, right, it can be really boring. And you can kind of go, uh -huh. and, but when you understand what's going on behind um, the meaning of that, it can be very uh, beautiful. And in fact, the, the, the genealogy in Matthew is a very interesting one because I, be I believe personally, this is what I felt God revealed to me in 2014, is that it's actually a poetic genealogy. And so many, there's many like, controversial commentaries about this genealogy because it's not exactly accurate. 
And so I thought about preaching, I'm not going to preach that again, but I do want to just kind of give you an overview of that because I believe there's, there's a, a meaning and there is a narrative, that's the name of, the, of the, the, that sermon was the narrative and the names. And there really was a narrative in the names. And if you take the names, and if you know anything about Scripture, and you know anything about the stories of like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, their names got changed. And when their names got changed, they took on a new uh, a meaning, a new purpose in life. And so as we read through the genealogy of Matthew, you actually see, if you, if you take the names and their meanings, there's a narrative that Matthew put together. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, you don't need to, to, to turn there, but Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, uh, he starts off and says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so he goes all the way back. He starts with Jesus. He goes back to David. Then he goes all the way back to Abraham. And then he begins his genealogy all the way back up to Jesus again. And as you look at the meaning behind the names, um, he, he moves on to verse 15. And he ends it with Eleazar, the father of Matan, and Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So he goes all the way back to Jesus, and he makes sure you understand that he comes through the lineage of David. Right? Because it's a beautiful thing. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in the text that we miss the message that God has for us. And don't miss the message here. If you take all the names and translate them into English, you get this poetic treaty, if you will, on the ultimate plan and purpose of God. A message regarding the mission of the Most High, if you will, that goes something like this. This is what, this is what you get if you translate all the names. It, it, it builds this beautiful poetic treaty that it sounds like this. It says, from a hilarious multitude of God-praisers comes forth a royal light which will bring forth a select group of royal princes clothed in strength, a nation of faithful harlots and friends, loved by God with wealth and peace and the covenant promise of Jehovah. He will multiply his children and bring healing through an established, predetermined confusion or exile. But fear not, our majestic Father is raising up a righteous helper established by God himself, and he will be worthy of praise, the helper of God and a true gift to his people. He will replace the added rebellion with salvation from God's chosen one. And so in this narrative, this narrative of names, in the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, we see the history of Israel. And we see it coming to a culmination with the birth of Jesus. And then he follows it up in, in verse 17. He says, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. From the deportation to Babylon to, the, to Christ, 14 generations. He says 14, 14, 14. But when you look at the genealogy, it's not. It's actually 13 in there. That's where there's this discrepancy and people go, well, I don't understand. It's because it's, it's poetic. Don't miss the message. Don't miss out on what God has for us because that poetic verse, verse 17, if you translate that and those words, you get this. The birth of a nation loved by God is eventually removed by force and confusion, the exile. But fear not, for a new birth will remove all confusion with the coming of our Savior, King. The Most High is on a mission. And in this genealogy, we see what that mission is. It's the history of Israel. And if you remember in the first century, they had been in exile for a number of years, hundreds of years. They'd been looking for the Messiah. They'd been looking for the King, the Messiah, which is the priest king. He fulfills both roles in their lives. And they've been looking for him and here in Matthew, the first chapter, the first thing he writes about, the genealogy tells the beautiful poetic story of the redemption of God's people. Preparing us for the birth of Jesus. So your first fill-in on your programs, if you've got a program, you've got a fill-in-the-blank on there, which I'd love for you to follow along. That's what it's there for. So it's don't miss the message this Christmas.
Don't miss the message. Don't get so caught up in the commercialism of Christmas, which we talked about last week, right? Marketing the Messiah is what we talked about last week, which is pretty funny. God created marketing. He's not afraid of it. He's the best marketer of all time. That's the birth of Jesus was, was the most successful marketing plan ever, right? The Bible is, is the most read book of all time. So don't miss the message and all, all of the, the chaos of Christmas. Don't miss what God has done or really has gone to great lengths to communicate to us. The largest organization of all time, best-selling book of all time, the biggest holiday of all time, Christmas. Thousands of lives, lives lost on behalf of this thing we call Christianity. Thousands of lives, including the life of Jesus Christ himself, God's only son. Don't miss what he's trying to convey to you, that he loves you that much. And that the Most High is on a mission. Don't miss the mission of sharing God's love with the world. So we're going to, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, that's where we're going to, we're going to read here from in just a minute. Um, before that, I thought I would get an actual joke that's not so um, horrible, hopefully. Uh, this is for all you millennials out there. If you're a millennial, I'm sorry. A successful businessman sat down with his new son-in-law to discuss his role in the family business. He said to him, I love my daughter, and now I welcome you into the family. To show you how much I care, I've made you a 50-50 partner in my business. All you have to do is go to the factory every day and learn how everything works. The son-in-law said, wow, that's very kind of you, but I hate to tell you, I hate factories. I just, I just can't stand the noise. Oh, I, I see, said the father-in-law. Well, in that case, uh, you can work in the office and take charge of some of the operations there. Oh, well, that's very kind of you, but I hate office work too, said the son-in-law. I can't stand being stuck behind a desk in an office all day, every day, day after day. Now, at this point, the father-in-law was getting a little annoyed, and he said, I just made you half owner of a huge money-making organization, but you don't like factories and you won't work in an office. What am I going to do with you? Easy, said the son-in-law. Buy me out. <laughs> that was better? That was a good one. It was a little better. It was a little better. The title of my message today is Keeping It in the Family or The Family Business. The family business. Luke 1, 26. We saw this before. It's the message sent by God's angel to Mary, prophesying over her, speaking to her about how she's about to have a baby. The baby would be Jesus. This is like probably the most important message Mary's ever heard. Probably the most important message that we could ever hear. The proclamation of this son, the Savior, coming to the world. Here's what it says in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Interesting. House of David. We saw that in Matthew 2. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. I shouldn't have said it. I mean, I mean if you read it, there's an exclamation point at the end, right? Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, as most people are when an angel visits them. I would be greatly troubled too. Not only at, at the, the visitation of the angel, but at the saying. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. She tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be, and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Everyone say, Jesus. 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 And he will be great. You might want to underline that, circle it, highlight it, whatever you want to do on your iPad, on your iPhone, in your actual Bible. He will be great 
and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. There's that word again, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child will the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. There's a, there's a lot packed into this message. A lot of big words that he's using to describe Jesus. Words that we should take note. They're very important about who Jesus is and what the mission of the Most High was in and through Jesus. The first is Jesus' name. Remember, names are important. There's a narrative in the names. The name of Jesus says a lot about him and what his mission was. It's the Greek form of Yeshua, which, which we know now as Joshua. So really, Jesus' name today would be Joshua. It's not Jesus. Right? It's not Jesus. It's Joshua. And that literally means deliverer or rescuer. Or Jehovah is salvation. So his life was all about rescuing God's people and about salvation. And it goes on and says, He will be great. And that word great in the Greek is megas, or highest rank. Highly esteemed. And so his name is salvation, it is deliverer, and he will be of the highest rank. He will be the most high. Elevated, lifted up, highly esteemed. Another phrase, he will be called the Son of the Most High. And that word most high is hupstistos in the Greek. That sounded a little Spanish, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, no, I'm sorry. It comes out every once in a while. But that also means of the highest rank. Hupstistos. No gods are above him. And if he is the son of this upstisos, he's an heir, which carries the same authority of his father, is of the same essence as God, is in fact deity, not just another deity, but the most high deity. He is his father's son. He will sit on the throne of David. He is of human royal blood and lineage. He is both God and man. You can see the genealogies in Matthew chapter 1 like I talked about, or Luke chapter 3, he does a genealogy as well. And they trace his lineage. He will be of the house of Jacob, or reign over the house of Jacob, actually. Which means he is of Hebrew and royal lineage. Once again, see the genealogy. His, eternal, his kingdom will be eternal which echoes the messianic prophecy that all the Jews had been studying and learning. And, and did you know, um, anybody familiar with, the, um, with, the, with Qumran, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Scrolls of Qumran, right? If you know anything about that. Did you know that that, that sect, they believed there was a sect of Jews that had taken those, scr those, uh, those scrolls, Put them in those clay pots. If you know the story, there's a little boy many, many years ago. I don't know how many years it was from now. It was like maybe 30 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe less. But he, he was throwing rocks into a cave, and he hit this clay pot, and he heard it break. So he went in and checked it out, and there's all these scrolls in these clay pots. And they traced it back. It's the, really the oldest living record that we have of Scripture. And did you know that those actually affirm the Masoretic text? of the Bible, the Old Testament that we have today. But they believe that, that, that um, the Jews of Qumran were actually a, a secret sect of Jews that were awaiting the Messiah. They had, they had set themselves aside to await for the Messiah. And they had collected these, these scrolls because they spoke of the Messiah. And they, and they were huddled around waiting um, for, for Jesus. They didn't know it was Jesus. They were looking for the Messiah. And so this idea that Jesus will reign over the house of Jacob and that his kingdom will have no end 
was one of those signs, one of those things from those scrolls that spoke of this eternal kingdom that Jesus would reign over, the Messiah would reign over, would be king over. It means it has no beginning, no end. And you can see that in 2 Samuel chapter 7 if you want to look that up, as well as other passages. And then towards the end it says that he will be, it will be holy. It will be called holy, which is hagios, the most holy thing, sacred, set apart, revered in religious awe, worthy of veneration. He will be the Son of God. Once again, there's that phrase again. This is huios theos, which literally means in the Greek, you know what that means? Son of God, when you, when you translate it from Greek to English... It means son of God. That deep scholarly work that I did to find that son of God means son of God. It means son of God. So I'll take all of that into consideration. We read through the, that passage, this, this prophetic word about who Jesus would be over, you know, the, the, the overshadowing of the, of the Holy Spirit on, onto Mary and speaking this prophetic word about her and about Jesus. He'd be the Most High, Son of the Most High. What does it mean? What does that mean to us? Like we can get so caught up in kind of doing studies about this kind of thing, and who is Jesus, and what, but what does it mean to us? How can we make it applicable to us? What do we walk away from having heard this beautiful story? It means that God's on a mission. The Most High is on a mission. What is the mission of God? The mission of God is to let the whole world know that He loves them so much that He would send His only Son. And that through His only Son, you could have a relationship with God. You see, the gospel as we know it, or as we should know it, is that you and I were created in the image of God. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, perfect. Human beings, perfect in the image of God. And then sin entered the world. And through that sin, we fell from perfection. And God has gone out of His way for thousands of years to try and help us, to restore us to that image. I mean, we started off with these these crazy sacrifices that they would do. Um, and if you read the Old Testament and the Torah, you hear the stories in the temple of the, the lamb and, and even the story of, of, of the Israelites. You know, if you've seen the movie Prince of Egypt, leaving Egypt and the Passover feast, you know, the sacrifice of the lamb and the blood of the lamb on the doorpost so that the death angel would pass over God's people. He's gone to great lengths to restore us into relationship with him, because sin is separated from his, from relationship, and the Bible says that the wage of sin is death. That's what we deserve for our sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, His Son. And so God sent His only Son. That's the mission of God, so that He could begin restoring us into correct relationship with Him, restoring us into that perfect image in which we were originally created. And so now, those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ and this gift that God has given us, we are now in the restoration process. God is restoring us, creating us, making us more and more like Him, transforming us from glory to glory. Every step of our walk in Christ is another step of glory closer to that perfect image. We will not be that perfect image until we see Him face to face. But here, in this life, we get to be more and more like Jesus every single day. And there is no better life than the life that God designed for you and for me. And so the message of the Most High, the mission of the Most High is this, that Jesus is the gateway to God. That's it. Jesus is the gateway to God. Through the atoning work of the cross, we have a gateway, a door Paul tells us, or Jesus tells us actually, a door to God. Jesus is the gateway to God, and he wants everyone to have a relationship with him. Everyone. That is his desire. 
So first and foremost, we are to revere this Jesus, to look upon Him with respect and with awe, to acknowledge that He holds the power of life and death, the keys to heaven and hell, to understand that this child that will be born to Mary will be the gateway to the Father, and that no man or woman will come to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus is the gateway to God. It doesn't matter if you're Buddhist, if you're Hindu, if you're Muslim, if you're Taoist, a Wiccan, a Catholic, a Lutheran, a Methodist, a Charismatic, Fundamentalist, Reformed, Arminianist. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you attend the Church of God or the Church of Satan. You have to go through Jesus to get to the Father. And at some point, the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I say, might as well do it now and begin to enjoy all that life in Christ has for us. Because Jesus is the gateway to God. Because He is God. Secondly, we need to be on mission with the Most High. First, Jesus is the gateway to God. Secondly, we need to know that we need to be on mission with the Most High. As a disciple of Christ, we should be about what Jesus is about. We should be about His kingdom, praying for what He prays for and doing what He does. That's why we're disciples. We call ourselves disciples. We're followers of Jesus, learners of Jesus. We should engage in the work and mission of Christ. Right? We learned that the first week. Christ mas. Mas is short for missio which is the Latin phrase and refers to the Latin dismissal in the Catholic Church where they would basically say, go and be on mission for Christ. Christ is Messiah, the Anointed One. So go and be on mission for Christ. We need to be on mission for the Most High. We should engage in the work and mission of Christ. Christ beautiful thing about that is that Jesus sits in the highest seat possible and has the most high, most supreme authority in the universe. And he's given the same authority to you and to me. And that's a whole other message that I'm going to skip over because we're running out of time. But you can read it in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples, so on and so forth. And as children of God, we carry that same authority. The anointing, and, and I love my favorite, favorite passage is, is Luke chapter 1. We just saw the story of Mary, but later on, we see this prophetic word that's spoken over John the Baptist, where he calls John the Baptist out and says, you will, you will bring people out of darkness and into light to share the salvation with them. You're going to prepare the way. That's our anointing. Each and every one of us have the anointing of John the Baptist, the calling to go and prepare the way for Jesus Christ. And we know we have the same authority that Jesus had because he gave it to us. And in John chapter 1, John tells us, verse 12, to all who did receive him, Jesus, who believed in his name, Jesus' name, he gave the right to become children of God. And as a child of God, we carry the authority of God, the authority of the Most High God. And therefore, we should be on mission with God, the Most High God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come as I close with these closing comments. First and foremost, it's time to join the family business. Don't look to be bought out. Join the family business business. God's made you a partner in the family business. This mission of the Most High. Marketing the Messiah. The Mashiach. It's time to join the family business. To join the mission of the Most High and sharing the greatest message of all time with the world. And I, 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 this is my, I think this is going to be my phrase for 2020. Right here at Convergence, many of you know, we're a brand new church. We've only been around for a little over two years. And, and God told me when we started this church to begin praying for workers. A lot of church planners would pray for the lost. God says the lost are everywhere. The lost are everywhere. 
We don't need to gather the lost. They're, they're right here. They're right outside. They're playing in the, in, the, in the play yard right there. We had a little kid come in this morning, right? We could see it on his face. He's sitting there while we were doing sound check, and we were playing. And he was just entranced by the music and the spirit of God in this place. And he was like, ah. And then his dad came. And his dad was like, come on, son. You know what he said? Daddy, I want to go to church. You can see the look in the dad's face. Oh, Didn't want anything to do with it. Everywhere. All over San Diego. You know that San Diego is one of the most unreached communities, cities in the, in the nation? One of the most unreached. They're saying it, it, it's upwards of 90% people in San Diego don't want anything to do with church, don't want anything to do with God, don't want anything to do with Jesus. And so this is my phrase. This is my phrase for 2020, I think. We're not looking for more parishioners. You know what a parishioner is? That's an old school word. Literally just people that come to church and sit in, in the seats and listen to the expert talk about Jesus. We don't need that. We don't need that. There's plenty of those. Plenty of churches like that. We don't need more parishioners. We need more partners. People that are going to come alongside and lock arms with us as we're on mission for Jesus. Partners that will come alongside us as we're on mission with the Most High, as we lock arms with Him. So you might say, well, that's great, Eric, but where do I start? Right here. You start right here. First, by just showing up. That is a good thing. Because here's the thing. I, I said this last week. I don't, I don't show up every Sunday because I want to hear myself preach. Like, I hear that all week long in my head. It's going on. It's just part of who I am. I'm constantly preaching at, at myself. Right? And these messages that I share on Sunday morning, they're as much for me as they are for you. So I don't come here just because, hey, it's an opportunity for me to preach again. Nope. Don't need it. We come here to share information with you, to cast vision for what we believe God's doing in this community so that you can get the information that you need. We have the announcements, which is a really important part of what we do because we're doing all kinds of activities, opportunities for you to engage with us. We're not trying to build a corporation here. We're trying to build a family. We're all about family. That's why we do these events. That's why we have the potluck today. That's why we have the breakfast tomorrow or next week for you to come and join us, not only for you to join us and be part of the family, but for you to invite people to enter into the kingdom of heaven along with you, to be on mission. And so, like I said, we're not looking for parishioners. We're looking for partners. Here's three ways for you to be on mission with the Most High. We use this word oikos here. If you've never heard it before, it's a Greek word. It means family. It's the 8 to 15 people that God has both strategically and supernaturally placed in your immediate sphere of influence. And if you're a guest with us this morning, you fill out a car to give it to us, we have a book for you called 8 to 15 written by my mentor, Tom Mercer. Just met with him on Thursday. The dude is like, Phew. I don't even know how to explain it. One of the largest churches in Southern California, up in a uh, 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 high desert, doing just incredible things. So we use this word oikos, two ways to be on mission with the most high. First and foremost, pray for your oikos. Grab a card off the back table, an Oikos card. It has slots for you to put your people that you're praying for, the 8 to 15 people in your immediate sphere of influence. It's pretty self-explanatory. Secondly, promote Oikos events. Events where we all get together. Opportunities for us to gather. There are flyers back there for next week, correct? For the breakfast. This is your last week to invite people to that. I expect there to be no flyers on that table back there today when I leave. Take them. That's what they're there for. Promote events, Oikos events, the potluck, Christmas breakfast. Take them to your home. Take them out to coffee. Which leads me to the third one. Be proactive about engaging your Oikos. Be proactive about engaging your your oikos. Begin thinking about how you can do that. Here's the thing. I wasn't going to share this. I'm going to share this. Last uh, week ago, Tuesday, I was at a prayer meeting, East County Pastor's Prayer. And 
you know, we put a lot of work into this church. We've actually sacrificed a lot to be here at Convergence. Um, I don't need to say more about that. But sometimes you get tired. And you, you, know, you look around and you go, gosh, what, God, what are you doing? What, did you really call us here? Because if you did, where's all the people? Right? Um, and so I was at this prayer meeting. We were praying, praying for the city, really. And I just had this vision of a field that had just been plowed. And, and I was like the farmer walking away from the field, walking to my house, walking into my home, and feeling good like a hard day's work. It had been like months, really, of work. And just feeling like, man, I'm tired, like a good tired, you know, like, oh, I'm tired. I've just been working hard. I feel good about what we did. And I look back at the field, and you know what I saw? I saw an empty field with neatly plowed rows. The field had been plowed. The seeds had been sown. And I was going inside. I look back at the field, and there's nothing there. And I look at it, and I go, man, there's nothing there. And every, every once in a while, you know, you get that sense of kind of disappointment. And I remember feeling that a little bit as I looked at this empty field that had just been plowed. And God said, you, you've done a good job. The work's been done. You've plowed the field. You've planted the seeds. Now you just got to wait for the rain. And you have no control over that. I bring the rain. So you can go inside, sit down, have your dinner, feel good about what you've done. It's kind of that old phrase, right? Like you work as if everything depended upon you, but pray as if everything depended upon him, because it does. I feel like that's where we are as a church. We've worked hard. We, I say this all the time. We have a staff here. None of them are paid. We have a staff here of a church of about six or 800 people. I really believe we could handle that. If God so desires. So now we just, we pray. We continue doing what we're doing, working hard, and we pray. We pray for our Oikos, right? We promote Oikos events, and we be proactive about engaging our Oikos. Amen? Amen. 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 Thanks for joining us online today. At Convergence SD, we envision a place where the people of God Converge with the purpose of God in establishing the kingdom of God. We'd love to hear how he's doing that in your life. So take a second and shoot us an email at info at convergencesd.com. Let us know how this ministry is impacting your life. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online at convergencesd.com or simply text your gift to 619-344-8454.